Good evening. Thank you all for joining us for the annual ConocoPhillips White House Lecture Series. This evening we're very pleased to uh, recognize that all of you come out on such a beautiful day outside. It's, it's air conditioned inside, so we should all email our friends back north and let them know how things are going down here. <laughs> and, and tell them a little bit about the wonderful uh, events that we have available to us here at the Bush School. Uh, today's event is a, uh, a talk by the very distinguished 16th Secretary of Transportation of the United States, Mr. Ray LaHood. And he will be introduced by our own Dean Ryan Crocker. So I'm looking forward to that. But before we go there, I want to just welcome each and every one of you here and especially welcome the people who make the Bush School possible because it's very important to us, to the Bush School, to the Moss Becker Institute, that we continue to recognize folks like Warren Finch. Thank you so much for coming, sir. Fred McClure. <laughs> Mayor Nancy Berry, it's really great to see you here. Uh, Ray Bowen, who's a member of our uh, Bush School Advisory Board. And Chuck Ellison and Teddy Ellison, who are members of our Development Council. We're really thankful that they're able to be here this evening. Okay. Now, our speaker tonight needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyway. So if you please help me welcome to the stage uh, Dean Ryan Crocker. Howdy. Howdy. Somebody has to say it. Uh, um, thank you all for coming this evening for a very special occasion. Uh, we are delighted that uh, uh, Secretary LaHood is accepting uh, uh, this year's Mossbacker Institute Good Governance Award. Uh, there are very few who come close uh, to personifying what good government is all about uh, than, uh, than Secretary LaHood. He um, spent uh, a dozen years on the staff of uh, then Minority Leader uh, Bob Michael, uh, and oddly enough, did not learn enough about how Congress really worked to dissuade him from seeking uh, Congressman Michael's seat when he retired in 1994. Uh, Secretary LaHood went on for uh, 14 years representing the 18th District of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's district, uh, and that is where I, I first met him. <coughs> uh, uh, Secretary LaHood came out to Syria. Um, he was then a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, and I was, I was ambassador to Syria. Syria is all his fault. <laughs> <laughs> During his time in Congress, uh, Secretary LaHood developed a strong reputation uh, for bipartisan leadership and bipartisan results. He, he got things done. He went on from Congress, of course, to be uh, Secretary of Transportation, a, a Republican in a Democratic administration. Uh, he said a lot of famous things, but one that really sticks with me is, uh, if I've got this right, uh, there are no Republican bridges mm -hmm. or Democratic highways. Uh, there is actually a Republican highway, uh, the, uh, the Ray LaHood Highway uh, in Illinois. It's a, it's a great thing to have a highway named after you and a highly unusual thing to have a highway named after you when you're still alive. It's a, it's a, <laughs> uh, there may not be Republican bridges and Democratic highways, but there certainly were highways and bridges uh, on the Secretary's watch. Uh, something like 350,000 miles uh, of, of roads either built or completely redone, and something like 20,000 bridges repaired. The Secretary would be the first to tell you, as he's told the nation, that his work was by no means done. And Along with many other things, um, he goes forward now as the co-chair of a, um, a, a bipartisan coalition, um, uh, Building America's Future, uh, where he has laid it out for us, uh, the need for a $3.6 trillion infrastructure investment simply to get the nation's infrastructure up to adequate. 
that will require an enormous bipartisan effort. Secretary LaHood, we look forward to you leading it. Please welcome the Secretary of Transportation. Well, thank you all very much for being here. This is obviously <clears throat> an honor for me and my wife, Kathy, to be in uh, this part of the world. We've never been here before. And uh, obviously, as somebody who's been in public service for almost 40 years, uh, I think the gold standard for public service is President Bush and what he did throughout his career in this library that we've had a chance to tour today is uh, stands as a, a real reflection of so many of the wonderful things he did for America and for the world and uh, I think it's a, a real tribute to all of you who uh, helped uh, make this possible and a tribute obviously to President and Mrs. Bush for uh, making this magnificent facility America uh, available to Americans um, and uh, to the world. I want to thank uh, uh, Ryan Crocker for his service, not only here, but uh, around the world in so many places and so many ways. Uh, Lori Taylor, thank you for uh, your leadership. Jennifer Moore, thank you for uh, hosting us today. Another one of my uh, heroes, if you will, and somebody that I've admired a long time is Fred McClure, who I know is spending a lot of time uh, providing a lot of uh, opportunities for, for this library. Fred and I uh, got to know one another when he began his work with President Reagan and then President Bush, and he's been a dear friend to, to our son Sam, who lives in Washington, D.C., and a dear friend to a lot of people uh, here. So uh, Kathy and I are delighted uh, to be here, and I will make some remarks and then uh, really uh, look forward to the questions that uh, will be uh, presented uh, to us. But I'm truly honored and humbled to accept the Mossbacker Institute Good Governance Award this evening. I applaud the work of the Institute. The nation needs to encourage innovative policy, research, and leaders who understand the diversity of the world economies and politics. In its programming, the Institute recognizes the good governance is critical for keeping the nation's economy competitive in today's globalized economy. In a few minutes, I will share some of my impressions of how our government could work together better. As you know, accepting the Good Governance Award carries with it the opportunity to deliver the ConocoPhillips White House Lecture. And um, although I've spent the bulk of my career, almost 40 years, in the people's branch of the federal government, the Congress, uh, it's also my privilege uh, to serve in what I have characterized as one of the most historic administrations uh, in the history of our country, uh, the opportunity to serve as the 16th Secretary of Transportation in President Obama's cabinet. If there's anything I've learned uh, in serving in government for 40 years, it is that effective governing requires bipartisanship and compromise. This is not a novel thought. Those of you here this evening know that President George Herper Walker Bush epitomized bipartisanship and compromise. It's embedded in his character and in his approach to governing. And he really is the gold standard when it comes to public service. Regrettably, bipartisanship and compromise are in short supply today, particularly in Washington, D.C. Mayor, I'm delighted that y you took the time to come here uh, this evening, and uh, uh, it's, it's a thrill to have uh, the mayor of the community uh, join us. Uh, consider the findings from a recent survey from the Pew Center for the People and the Press. More than 80% of those surveyed say the country is more politically divided these days than in the past. Further, the American public is deeply pe pessimistic about the prospects for 
bridging the broad political divisions that threaten our capacity to govern. Folks who cite an economic issue as the top national problem have almost given up on Washington's ability to solve it. About three quarters of them include, including large majorities of Republicans, Democrats, and Independents say they do not think President Obama and Republican leaders will make progress on whatever national problems they mentioned. Fully 71% say a failure of Republicans and Democrats to work together over the next two years will hurt the nation a lot. Our governing institutions suffer from incessant partisan conflict. The president's job approval rating hovers around 50%, just 22% express a favorable opinion of Congress. Positive views uh, have remained below 30% for more than th three years. It wasn't supposed to be this way. I have written a memoir entitled Seeking Bipartisanship, My Life in Politics, which will be published this summer. As you might imagine, several chapters deal with my time in the President's Cabinet as a Republican I begin those chapters by considering a perplexing question. Why did the promise of bipartisanship, a promise so powerfully expressed by the new president, even as he campaigned in 2007 and 2008, go unfulfilled? I say perplexing because the explanation still confounds me. Nonetheless, it is a question worth exploring this evening. I should take a moment here to explain why I place such great stock in bipartisanship. I consider myself a graduate of the Robert H. Michael School of Applied Political Arts and Sciences. Bob Michael served with distinction in the House of Representatives for 38 years, including 14 as Republican leader, the longest serving tenure as Republican leader in the history of the House. He was Republican leader during President Reagan's eight years, four years of President Bush, and two years at, under President Clinton. He hired me in 1983 as his district assistant, and when he retired from the House in 1994, I was his chief of staff. Bob taught us by example that the House floor should be a forum for reasoned debate among colleagues equal in dignity. He came to the House every day to do the work of the people, not to engage in ideological melodramas or political vendettas. Let me be clear, Bob was and is a proud Republican, a steadfast Republican, a conservative Republican. There is no mistaking his politics, but he took a page from one of his political heroes, Everett McKinley Dirksen, who once represented the district that Bob and I both represented. And he famously said, quote, I am not a moralist, I'm a legislator, end of quote. Legislating meant something different then than it apparently does today. Thanks to these leaders, there existed a common belief that no matter whether you wanted more government or less, you had to legislate to do it. And to legislate required mutual respect, civil discourse, some degree of humility, and a proper appreciation for the role of Congress. Those qualities ought to be common sense. Bob served, as I said, under three Democratic speakers, Tip O'Neill, Jim Wright, and Tom Foley. Let me offer one seemingly small example. The art of governing, according to Bob Michael, involves a pretty simple notion. The words that you use matter. After all, the way you talk to one another is the foundation for whatever personal relationships you develop. Too often, however, political debates are couched in language favored by the most ideological, the language of the battlefield. Politics, we are told, is war. Those who disagree with us are the enemy. We should take no prisoners and our disagreements are to be fought in the trenches. Bob Michael refused to follow suit. He had served as a con combat infantryman in World War II. He landed on Normandy Beach, 
on D-Day plus six and fought his way across France and Belgium into Germany. He was wounded by, by machine gun fire and received the Purple Heart, two Bronze Stars, and four Battle Stars. Bob Michael, I knew, the Bob Michael I knew, knew about real war firsthand. This combat veteran never referred to politics as war. He knew the difference. He taught all of us who worked for him, including myself, that, that differences in politics do not make adversaries. We do not have to be enemies. I hope that my career, the lessons I learned from Bob Michael, have been reflected in my service. I decided not to run for re-election to my seat in the House of Representatives in 2008. It was time to leave. I spent 14 years there cultivating a civil, bipartisan approach to politics and problem solving, but with only modest success. The highlight was a series of four bipartisan retreats that I helped co-chair and organize over a course of a decade. Regrettably, however, those retreats did not overcome the immense challenges posed by the partisan forces in the House. And if I can just say parenthetically, our first bipartisan retreat we held at Hershey, Pennsylvania. We had over 200 members of the House, 150 spouses, 100 congressional kids. We spent a weekend together getting to know one another. It was the first opportunity that congressional spouses met other congressional spouses Congressional kids met other congressional kids. When you know somebody, it's very hard to insult them, and you begin to pe treat people with respect. And that's what these retreats were about. Working across the aisle, the House did pay a personal <laughs> dividend, however. In early December 2008, a fellow by the name of Rahm Emanuel, now the mayor of Chicago, then chief of staff to uh, pr president-designate uh, Obama uh, called me uh, after he had been elected to the Congress and said we need to work together and we did work together and we co-hosted bipartisan dinners he would invite eight Democrats I would invite eight Republicans we'd go to a restaurant in Washington and we would make friendships and these friendships have endured long beyond our, our time in Congress and this was the way that we felt that we could really begin uh, to work together. And following that kind of friendship, uh, I want to tell you the story about how I became acquainted uh, with then uh, candidate uh, Obama, a candidate for the United States Senate. Uh, after President Obama, or Senator Obama, was elected to the United States Senate, he called me in Peoria. I'd never met him. Ray, this is Barack Obama. I'm coming to Peoria. I want to sit down and talk to you about how we can work together for Illinois. He had just been elected to the Senate. I was serving in the House. He came to Peoria a week later. We met in my congressional office, and for 90 minutes we talked about how we could work together, and for two years we did. I tell you that story because I believe that bipartisanship is a part of the President's DNA. And for two years, we did work together for Illinois. And then I decided to retire. I ran into the then candidate for President Obama in the Capitol. He said to me, what are you going to do when you leave Congress? I said, I don't know. He said, if this thing works out uh, for me, for President, I'm going to be looking for some Republicans. And after th then, Senator Obama was elected to the White House. On a very cold day in December, Kathy and I drove to Chicago. I sat with then the president-elect for 40 minutes. We talked about how we could work together in his new administration, and he offered me the post of Secretary of Transportation. And I tell you that story because I think it was really, uh, again, the opportunity for the president to bring into his cabinet a real Republican, and what I mean by that is I'd actually been elected as a Republican seven times uh, from central Illinois. Uh, that really, I think, uh, in, enabled me uh, to continue my public service, to continue my government service, and uh, to also uh, be a part of an administration that wanted to work across the aisle and really make things happen. And uh, 
people have asked me what it's like, what was it like serving as a Republican? I was warmly welcomed. My House colleagues embraced uh, my opportunity to serve in the administration and to be helpful to them. I happened to go on the John Stewart show and uh, he said to me, how do these Republicans treat you uh, now that you're uh, hooked up with Obama? And I said, well, look it, I've got a lot of money and they're looking for it and so I'm, I'm, I'm willing to fund their projects. So they like me, uh, they like me a lot. And, uh, and so th th the reason I tell this story also is that um, I'm a Republican. I believe in the Republican principles, but I also believe in government service. And I believe that the way that things can get done is also in a bipartisan way with compromise. But more importantly, and this is what I told the people back home in my hometown of Peoria, I'm an American first. I believe in America. And I believe this opportunity presented me a way to continue to work for the American people. And uh, I appreciated the opportunity that the president uh, really gave to me uh, to continue my public service and to really uh, make a difference. And when the president did this, he knew that I was a delegate for John McCain, I worked for John McCain, and he knew that I was uh, a, a strong Republican and somebody uh, who uh, really uh, was for his opponent. But it didn't make any difference to him. And when you look at other people that he put in the cabinet, he was willing to set aside whatever political uh, differences that he had. The reason I tell you all of this is because I believe that when the election's over, the American people want Congress and the President to work together to solve problems and to sit down and to really make a difference. And that is not happening today in Washington, D.C. And um, you all know uh, that there are some major things that need to happen. We need immigration reform. We need uh, tax reform. And I, I could go on for another hour talking about the need for infrastructure uh, reform and an infrastructure bill. And nobody in Washington is talking to one another about these issues. And uh, if we had the kind of leadership where people were talking to one another and working with one another, I think these issues uh, would be on the front burner. Uh, but it's not happening. It should be happening. Uh, let, let me finish with this idea. Um, I'm optimistic. I'm not an optimistic about the next year and a half. <laughs> but I am optimistic that something will happen after the next election. It is very clear all of the happy talk after the November election between Senate Majority Leader McConnell and Speaker Boehner about really getting things done here we are, January, February, almost at the end of March. What's been accomplished? It was almost impossible to pass a budget. It barely did not happen for the Department of Homeland Security, the people that protect our country. And so I think that when you look at new administrations, and I think, frankly, the next year and a half, I'm not very optimistic that anything will happen with immigration reform. I'm not optimistic that anything will happen with tax reform. I'm not optimistic that the Congress would pass a six-year bill. But I remember this. When I came to Congress in 1994, we came into the majority. Republicans came into the majority. Speaker Gingrich, very strong personality. President Clinton, very strong personality. You know what the two of them did? They did what the American people wanted. They worked together. We passed welfare reform. Now, President Clinton vetoed it twice. The third time, he signed it. We passed three balanced budgets. That couldn't have happened unless Republicans were willing to compromise with President Clinton. We passed tax reform. We passed two six-year infrastructure bills for our country. When you had two strong personalities, can it be done? Yes, it can be done. There's a little, I think there's a little window of opportunity after the 2016 election. If you look at what President Bush, George, 
Herbert Walker Bush did in the beginning of his term. If you look at what George W. Bush, no child left behind. Senator Kennedy, strong Democrat, John Boehner in the House, heading up the Education Committee, because they knew President Bush wanted that bill passed, and they did it. You look at what happened after 9-11. The country came together and the Congress came together, and we got a lot done, and we made a difference. So I think whoever is elected in 2016, there will be a window of opportunity. When President Obama got elected in, in, in 08 and came into office in 09, he passed some big things. You may not agree with any of them, but they did some big things. And then all of a sudden, uh, people came to Washington, some who don't believe in government, some who want to vote no on everything. So I'm optimistic based on the past, based on what President Bush did, President George W. Bush, President Clinton, and what President Obama did. In the beginning, there's hope and opportunity. But we need to have people in Washington that are not afraid of the word compromise, they're not afraid of the word bipartisanship. If you look at every major problem our country has solved, it hasn't been solved by one party or one person. It's been solved by the 435 in the House, the 100 in the Senate, and who's ever in the White House. So I'm optimistic that after the presidential campaign, after a vigorous debate about whatever the issues are, and I have no idea who the next president will be, but I know this, the country is weary. The country is worried. The country is concerned that their problems aren't being solved, that their roads aren't being fixed, that as people are doing their tax returns, the code is so complicated, nobody can do their own income tax returns, that it, we have these millions of people living in this country. And those are three examples, but you can think of three more. And so we need to get back to what made our country great. People in Washington willing to work together, willing to work in a bipartisan way, willing to be, uh, compromise, willing to make a difference. Not compromise on their principles, but compromise in a way that reflects what the American people want. And if we do that, then we can get back on track. That can come with people in Washington taking a page out of what goes on around the country, what goes on in Texas or in Illinois, where people, I guarantee you, not everybody in this room agrees on everything, but what, what do you do? You sit around, what do they do at a library board meeting, a church board meeting, a school board meeting? People come together, they sit at a table, they work out their differences, they compromise, and they solve a problem. That's what we used to do in Washington. And we're not doing it today. And we need to get back to it. And it's going to have to come from the people. The people are going to have to require their elected officials to do their job, to solve problems, to make America great again. And if we do that, uh, then we can all take great satisfaction in this great system that we have, that we can all make a difference. And I think uh, all of you uh, believe in that. And uh, you've all made a difference uh, in the community you leave, live in and this institution. And uh, again, I am delighted and humbled and, and, and gratified and just grateful for uh, this award that you're giving me and, uh, and the fact that uh, you have recognized uh, that in the past, when people have been willing to work together, problems get solved that bipartisanship and compromise are not bad words, and that it, it, it is those uh, ways of doing things that have moved our country forward. So again, thank you to all of you for being here, and uh, I look forward to having a chance to interact a little bit with any questions you might have. Thank you very much. This is the... Oh, it's on there.
It's on. Hello. Thank you. I had a great uh, opportunity today to visit with two classes. Are any of the, raise your hand if you're here. Yeah, look at all the students. Uh, they've already heard all of this, so <laughs> they came back for more. That's encouraging to see these young people coming back for more. Oh, okay. They, they came for the food. Well, I mean, they're grad students. Yeah, okay. <laughs> First is, what do you think of President Obama and the White House saying the German airline crash in the Alps this week did not involve terrorism only hours after the crash occurred? You're on, not on. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank goodness she wasn't on. I'm, uh, <laughs> how the heck am I going to answer that? <laughs> I get to grill you with that okay. bright light in your All right. eyes. Okay. And I'm just generally going to put you on the spot. Say, what do you think of President Obama and the White House saying the German airline crash in the Alps did not involve terrorism only hours after the crash occurred? Well, look, at, I, I, I assume that they uh, have very good intelligence and people gave them information. And um, I don't know if it was disclosed today that it was a, a terrorist attack or not. but. Uh, uh, I have to assume they, they, they know what they're talking about when they say things like that. Obviously, that's a very serious statement. Mm -hmm. Great. So changing gears slightly, how can we help our state and local departments of transportation focus on maintaining and operating existing infrastructure rather than continuing to add new highways even as driving is in decline? Look, at I, I can do another uh, half hour on this transportation infrastructure, but I won't. But but you know, you all know, um, America's one big pothole right now. If you if you if you live in a state where Kathy and I live in Illinois, the, we've had three brutal winters, and the roads are crumbling, bridges are falling down. Congress passed a two-year bill which is expired. The highway trust fund is broke. And states are having a hard time. They have no, no, no big picture, no grand plan. When I was in Congress, as I said, we passed two six-year bills and funded them. A six-year bill gives certainty to governors, to planners, to know what's gonna, the, what money is going to be available, what projects can get funded, and then they can go to the engineers and really start planning. Right now, we don't even have a transportation program. It's been extended. The Highway Trust Fund is broke. We need people in Washington to go back to the idea that the Highway Trust Fund built America. It helped governors all over the country provide money to these governors to do the things they need to do. And we, we don't have the leadership right now. People are afraid to raise the gas tax. They shouldn't be afraid of it. They shouldn't. It hasn't been raised in 20 years. You have gas prices at just a little above $2 a gallon in your own state. And uh, we, we need to do a lot more. We need a lot more leadership. Uh, and uh, until we get it, until we raise the gas tax, until we get a big pot of money, until we get a six-year bill, every governor in the country is just going to have problems doing all they need to do. Every commissioner in, in your state is going to have problems planning ahead, knowing where to put the resources. And I will also tell you this. I come from a state that does this, and I know your state does it. We've got to stop diverting gas tax dollars that go to roads when people think they buy a gallon of gas, that tax is going to fix up a road, and it may be going to pay some state policeman's salary or something else. Those diversions need to stop, but the federal government's got to get its act together, pass a big bill, pass an increase in the gas tax, Let's get America moving again. You're back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Welcome back. So, thank you. So, so why are, are we stuck in terms of getting a big bill? Is because, it the because politicians are afraid to raise the gas tax. Look, at, I, I got elected seven times. I know people pay a lot of taxes. I know they do. This tax is a user fee. 
It hasn't been raised in 20 years. In, in states where they've passed referendums to raise the sales or gas tax to pay for infrastructure, 95% of them pass. Why? Because people know the money's going to go to fund friends and neighbors who are going to build the roads. They know potholes are going to get filled. They know bridges are going to get fixed. When you invest in infrastructure, you invest in America. That money doesn't stay in Washington. Politicians are afraid if they raise the taxes, somebody's going to run a 30-second commercial, you raise my tax. But if the road gets fixed and the bridge gets fixed and you create economic opportunities then and, and people go to work, I think you can make the argument. Part of being a congressman or a congresswoman or a senator is coming back home and explaining to people why you did what you did. Here are the reasons for it. It's not just going to Washington and voting. It's coming back home and explaining to your constituents, this is the reason we needed to do this. OK. So, <laughs> so one more question um, from the peanut gallery. So could you share your thoughts on the decision by Congress to base the MAP 21 funding distribution to states using the 2000 census instead of the 2010? Well, I think, it, first of all, MAP 21 is the transportation bill that was passed a few years ago. Two-year bill, in my opinion, a very chintzy bill. And the reason they did it that way is because they could only find $100 billion. The bill ended up being $109 billion. And they were trying to find the least costly. They wanted to pass a bill, first time in the history that anybody can remember they ever passed a two-year bill rather than a six-year bill, and they did it basically because that, that's all the money they could come up with, and that, that year's formula helped them with the, the calculations to get to the money they had. Why did they think they only had such a chintzy amount of money for that year? Uh, because they didn't want to raise the gas tax. That was the amount of money that the gas tax brought in, mm -hmm. and um, it just, you know, people are driving less, driving more fuel-efficient cars and the money just simply wasn't there. How would you suggest we get those people in the, those Leafs and other electric cars to contribute to the roads You know, so what some states are doing, in uh, Virginia they passed a, a tax mm -hmm. on people who buy hybrids or all battery powered to make up for uh, the, the, uh, the gas tax that they don't pay as a result of driving a hybrid or battery powered, because obviously they're not at the gas pump. So some states are actually passing a tax on people when they buy an electric-powered or hybrid car. You think that fly nationally? I think it's going to be debated when the Congress ever gets around to debating a highway or a transportation bill. I think they will, because a lot of people are, are buying battery-powered and hybrid cars, and I do think that uh, uh, the Congress will debate that whether to add an additional tax to make up for the gas receipts that people aren't paying because they're, they're driving a battery-powered car. So what would you say was your greatest accomplishment as Secretary of Transportation? I, I think that uh, our legacy will be safety. And here's what I mean by that. Um, every day, all of you, and thousands of people all over America get in their car, get on a bus, get on a train, get on an airplane. And the one thing that people don't think about is safety. That's what we thought about every day at DOT. How do we make the roadway safer? How do we make flying safer? How do we make train people that ride trains? And I can tell you that in every one of those modes of transportation, there was some kind of a major accident. The worst day on my job was when I received word that the Colgan air crash took place in Buffalo, New York. 49 people perished on that plane, and I guarantee you all 49 of those people thought they were going to arrive safely from Charlotte to Buffalo. And because the pilots were poorly trained, the plane iced up, they did completely the wrong thing, the plane crashed. The train crash that occurred in Washington, D.C., or um, California, because the driver was distracted 
Uh, eight people were killed in one of those accidents, four people. Look at people get on these, these trains and they, or a bus. Think of the bus crashes that we had. So we took all of that. Pipeline safety was under our jurisdiction. We had an explosion in California and in Pennsylvania. We went to Congress. We got a very strong pipeline safety bill. We got better training for pilots after the Colgan Air crash. We got a transit safety bill passed after the train crash in Washington, D.C. And so we, being Secretary of Transportation, I think safety was our number one priority. And I, and I will tell you this. The day we walked in the door on January 23rd, 09, not one person in America was talking about distracted driving. 18 states had passed laws. Today, 43 have passed laws. You can't drive safely while you're texting. And you can't drive safely if you have a phone up to your ear. And we began to persuade legislators all over America mm -hmm. to pass laws to prohibit people or to fine people when they're driving uh, using a cell phone or texting and driving. And we're proud of that. So I think safety in all modes of transportation and everything under our jurisdiction, uh, I can tell you this, something I didn't know when I walked in the door on January 23rd, 09, there's a crisis, at least one crisis every day for every secretary in every agency uh, of government. There just is. 55,000 people, $70 billion budget, trains, planes, automobiles, buses, and uh, you just have to rely on good people. There are a lot of good people working in government. We should, we should feel self-assured and, and, and comfortable about that. We had some great people working. 55,000 employees, 38,000 at the FAA, a lot of air traffic. We had sleepy air traffic controllers falling asleep. Had to fire a couple of them. Again, just, you know, things that you don't really think about when you sign on for these jobs. But people expect you to be taking care of them. So you said you had some great people working for you. And we got a lot of students out here that are training to become public servants. And what do you consider the most important skill that they need to acquire in order to be able to become the kind of people you'd be glad to have in your agency? What I told the students today, how many students heard my little lecture on, yeah, just a few, so. Uh, um, what I told the students today is that uh, leadership is a very, very hard thing to quantify. Um, and everybody in this audience has had somebody who's been a mentor to them and given them a good notion of what a leader can and cannot be. We all have. It's like when I go in and talk to a group of prospective teachers. I taught school for six years. Everybody in this audience has a favorite teacher. And when I say that, you'll think about who that person is. We all do. And everybody in this room has had some person who was a good mentor to them, who helped them, helped you become a good leader. And part of it is listening, part of it is respecting, part of it is delegating, part of it is being a team player, part of it is sharing information. It's a combination of a lot of different things, but you know a good leader when you've served with one, and you know a bad leader when you've served with one. And you know what the qualities are, people that give you the opportunity to reach your potential, people that help you learn, people that help, people that give you good advice. And so what we did when we came to the job at DOT or in Congress, we interviewed all of the people we hired. I personally interviewed the 100 people that I hired. Some came from the White House, some came from other places. We hired the very best people. We build a team. When you build a team, then every it's inclusive. And you share information. And the only thing I said to people that we hired no secrets. I don't want to read about you or anything you're doing in the newspaper, and I want you to be a team player. That means share information, respect ideas, get the job done, and um, when you do that, um, these are common sense things. All of you that have been in leadership roles know what I'm talking about. 
And the one thing that I said to the students, that I say to students all the time, part of your responsibility as a leader is to be a mentor. When you walk out of your job, when you leave your job, when you walk out the door, are you going to be able to look back and see somebody who's there to take your place, to carry on, to be a mentor for someone else? That is our obligation as leaders, to mentor others, to help them develop good skills, to help them be leaders so they can mentor someone else. That, that, that's just a big part of being a leader. So which is a better job, secretary or congressman? The best job I've ever had is, um, let's see, 48 years being married to Kathy. Okay. <laughs> the best job that I've been paid for <laughs> is, um, is DOT. I mean, it's an extraordinary privilege to work for any administration. I know there are a lot of people probably in this room that didn't vote for President Obama, uh, but he, I explained how it works. He and I were friends before he became president and while I was a sitting member of Congress and he was a senator. Our friendship endures. Uh, about a month ago he called, he didn't call me, but his staff called me and said, hey, we're going out to Chicago. The president wants you to ride along with him. And we went to an event, went to a couple events. I sat the conference room on Air Force One, and uh, we talked for almost an hour about our families, uh, just a, we're friends. And so my point is that DOT offered an opportunity to really make a difference in safety, in transportation, and, um, and to really be a part of an administration that on this side uh, really cared about uh, transportation and infrastructure, and the president really does care about it. Plus, DOT has always been bipartisan. Under President George W. Bush, Norm Mineta, a 30-year Democratic congressman from California, served as the DOT secretary. So it, there's always been a bipartisan. That's when, when, when the ambassador used that quote, there's no Democratic or Republican bridges, there's no Democratic or Republican roads. It, 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 these are, this is about America. So talk to me about the Keystone Pipeline. <laughs> uh, what I told the students today and what I tell other people, I don't know if there's any media here, but <laughs> this one could get me in trouble. <laughs> um, it's not going to happen in the next year and a half. It'll be a big, big part of the presidential debate, but it's obvious that President Obama does, does not want the Keystone Pipeline. So it's not going to happen under this administration. Why do you suppose that is? Uh, because I think uh, the president uh, believes that it environmentally is not a good thing to do. I mean, I, I'm simplifying it, mm -hmm. but I think that that's the bottom line. And I, but I do think it will be, I think, immigration, I think tax reform, <coughs> I think um, our economy, I think the Keystone Pipeline. Domestically, these are all the issues that the candidates are going to be talking about between now and 2016. You closed your, your earlier remarks talking about how the, you were hopeful for uh, early in the next administration that, that people might be able to get something done. So which of the potential candidates do you think is most likely to be able to get something done? <laughs> uh, well, I think your senator who just announced at Liberty University who wants to eliminate the IRS, I, who's going to collect the taxes? <laughs> All of you that are paying them don't want them collected, right? <laughs> um, I, think, uh, I think Jeb Bush and or Hillary Clinton, either one, there'll be a lot of goodwill for several months if either one of them were to get elected. And what do you think would, should be their first priority? Well, I think always, you know, unless, you know, un unless uh, there's something going on internationally, I mean, obviously, we've got to continue to be vigilant against these terrorists, which I think anybody would do that. But the economy, 
getting people to work in good paying jobs. And then, you know, look, at I'm, I'm very biased. We need a six year transportation bill. We need to get America's tra infrastructure, you know, back on track. We're like a third world country right now. China's gonna build 85 new airports. We haven't built a new airport since anybody can remember. And, you know, we got the best interstate system in the world, but it's turning to gravel because of these brutal winters. So I think on the domestic side, immigration, tax reform, um, um, infrastructure, you know, maybe the Keystone Pipeline, too. <laughs> so one of the issues where, when people push back on the need for a, a, a big infrastructure yeah. bill is the, the bridge to nowhere argument, the yeah. idea that you we're know, not keeping an are gone. eye on it. Yeah, earmarks are gone. The, the, the reason earmarks are gone is because of the bridge to nowhere. I went to Alaska when I was DOT secretary, and I looked for the bridge to nowhere. <laughs> and what I found is a plan to connect one part of Alaska with another part over a body of water where there were lots of people living on the other side. So I, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is the bridge to nowhere was, was a, an idea that two senators and the one congressman from Alaska thought was a good idea for their state. And the people thought it was a good idea. But it helped eliminate earmarks, which a lot <laughs> of people are happy about. But we've still been able to move forward uh, in spite of the fact that earmarks are gone. I, I was on the Appropriations Committee, and I, I sought earmarks. But every, every idea from, for an earmark that I ever got in an appropriation bill did not come from Ray LaHood. I wasn't sitting around in my living room drawing up a list. You know where they came from? From my constituents. Ray, we need this road. Ray, we need this bridge. Ray, we need, that's where they came from. Look at the money, the money's gonna be spent, but it's gonna be designated by bureaucrats and people who write bills in Washington, D.C. Earmarks are gone. Were they bad? I don't think so. Did they serve? Did they serve a good purpose? I believe they did. But so they're gone. Do you want them back? It doesn't make any difference what I want. I'm not in Congress anymore, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully. Well, we want to thank you, thank you. for your very entertaining remarks. Thank um, you. And we'd like to invite Dean Crocker to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes, it, it, it's very, my very great pleasure to provide Secretary LaHood with the Mossbacher Good Governance Award. The Good Governance Award recognizes people that are the exemplars for the Bush School, that are able to accomplish great things, that are able to um, move, make the world move forward, recognize and promote exemplary achievements in channeling high quality policy analysis into good governance and public service. And it should be quite clear to you why we've chosen to provide this award to Secretary LaHood today. The text of the award, because we're real good at puns, says throughout this distinguished career, Secretary LaHood has frequently bridged the divide of partisan politics to further national goals. We honor Secretary LaHood for contributing independent, nonpartisan analysis and consistently effective leadership to the development and implementation of public policy. So now let me get the big crystal doohickey, which is over here. <laughs> Stay slow. Oh, there it is. Yeah. I'll well, get it. Let's go over. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I will promise not to lose it this time. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you all and good night.